Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over Chapter 2, which is Atoms, Molecules, and Ions in Chemistry by Zumdahl, 7th edition. So just like in our last video, we're going to be skipping some of those sections. So if it's in a section that you don't actually see on here, you don't need to remember anything from it. All right, so Section 2.2 is on Fundamental Chemical Laws, and there are three important chemical laws that it discusses. The first one being the Law of Conservation of Mass by Antoine Lavoisier. Uh, it says mass is neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. So in the first unit, uh, when we were doing particle diagrams, hopefully you remember seeing um, the decomposition of water molecules. Um, what the law of conservation of mass says is that all that's happening in a chemical reaction are that the atoms themselves are being rearranged. Um, you're not adding new atoms that are outside of the chemical reaction in. We're not creating new atoms. The law of definite proportions, that's by Proust. Um, it says that a given compound always has the exact same proportions of element by mass, meaning that if you take a water molecule from the tap water in your house, or if you take a water molecule from, I don't know, uh, Europa, um, it doesn't matter whether you get one from here or somewhere else in the solar system. It's always going to be made up of two hydrogens and one water. Okay, last fundamental chemical law, the law of multiple proportions by John Dalton. Uh, it says when two elements form a series of compounds, the ratios of the masses of the second element that combine with one gram of the first element can always be reduced to small whole numbers. What that's getting at is it doesn't matter if you have nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, dinitrogen monoxide, um, regardless of what your little um, ratios will be, they will always be reducible to whole numbers. So you can't have a fraction of an element, you can't have um, a fraction in a chemical formula. There's no such thing as that. It's always going to be whole numbers. So now we're going to skip to section 2.5, the modern view of atomic structure. So this is our standard diagram of an atom. Uh, what we have here is electrons that are being represented by this cloud. So specifically, uh, this electron cloud is darker where you're more likely to find the electron, and then lighter where you are less likely to find the electron. So what we can see is that closer to the nucleus, we have a greater likelihood of finding an electron, and the further out we get, the less likely it is until we get to just kind of like this white area where there is virtually a 0% chance of finding an electron. Electrons are found outside of the nucleus nucleus, the nucleus being the center here, and they are negatively charged. Protons are found in the nucleus, they are positively charged, and they are always going to be equal to the magnitude of the electron's negative charge, and that's true of all atoms. So if you have, you know, a plus five charge of protons here, you're going to have a negative five charge of electrons in the electron cloud. Neutrons are also found in the center of the nucleus here, right in the middle of the atom. But they have no charge. They virtually have the same mass as a proton. Okay, so in reality, they weigh a little bit more, but not enough that it would make a difference in any of the calculations we would be doing in chemistry. Okay, so just keep in mind the nucleus is very small compared with the overall size of the atom, and it is extremely dense. Almost all of the mass actually comes from the nucleus. The electrons are so small and moving so quickly, they actually have very little influence on the mass of the atom itself. So let's talk about isotopes, because frequently uh, isotopes are where people have a couple of issues, because um, I think it's the neutrons that always throw people off. So atoms that have the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons are what isotopes are. They show almost identical chemical properties. And remember, chemistry is normally actually due to the electron properties of things. So for example, um, let's say I have two isotopes of oxygen. Um, it doesn't matter which isotope of oxygen I choose. Regardless of which one I choose, the electron number is going to be the same. The only thing that will have changed is the number of neutrons that are in the nucleus of the atom. So maybe one isotope would be heavier than the other one, but still it wouldn't change the actual chemical properties that that oxygen uh, atom possesses. Also in nature, most elements contain a mixture of all of the isotopes. 
So um, there are, well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, chapter 3 tells us all about that. But in reality, if I take a sample of oxygen, um, some of those oxygen molecules would be heavier than others because some of them would have more neutrons than others. But if I take an average of those, then I would end up getting um, the same number pretty much every single time. Now let's look at two isotopes of sodium. So right here we've got sodium-23, right here we have sodium-24. So sodium-23 is made up of 11 protons and 12 neutrons. Sodium-24 uh, is made up of 11 protons and 13 neutrons. So if you're wondering, okay, um, why does this matter? Um, why it matters is because uh, each one of these technically has a different mass number. So right here, you can see the number of protons is the same for each isotope, and that's true because sodium always has 11 protons. That's why it's number 11 on the periodic table. But where it changes is where we have our 12 neutrons versus our 13 neutrons. So this one is going to be heavier, which means that if I were to weigh it or something, if that makes sense, um, I would get a different weight, I would get a different mass if I were to weigh this one. So why does this matter? Well, I'm glad you asked. Isotopes can be written in this kind of notation. So I call this isotope notation. Um, a lot of times you don't see the Q, but um, since we're going to be talking about ions, I decided to include the Q. Isotopes are identified by uh, three things, two of which are mentioned in your book, and then charge won't be mentioned until later on in the unit, but still. Um, atomic number is abbreviated as the capital letter Z. It tells us the number of protons. So in our example where we had sodium-23 and sodium-24, notice that the 11 was written here because the atomic number for sodium was 11. The mass number, on the other hand, that's A. That's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So sodium-23 gets its name because 23 is the mass number of that sodium atom. Sodium-24 gets its name because uh, 24 is the mass number of that sodium atom. And again, in case you're wondering about the whole mass number thing, um, a lot of times uh, people forget that, remember, since most of the mass comes from the protons and neutrons, we're ignoring the mass of the electrons, and that's why we're getting a nice round number here. Um, electrons weigh fractions of a proton, and it's such a small amount, it doesn't end up changing anything. The charge, on the other hand, is abbreviated as lowercase letter Q, and that is the number of protons minus the number of electrons. Okay, Remember, in an atom, they are always the same. So from that previous slide, you saw that it said the magnitude of the electrons is always equal to the magnitude of the protons. That is true in any atom. Where the charge is different is when we end up dealing with ions, and so ions are where the charge matters. But um, for just our sake, if you have these two parts where we have our mass number and atomic number, you're okay. It's just charge matters for ions, which we haven't gotten to yet. So here we go. A certain isotope X contains 23 protons and 28 neutrons. And so what is the mass number of this isotope? Okay. So 23, 28, that would give us the most mass. And so let's figure out what element it is. That means we have a mass number of 51, right? Because 28 plus 23 is 51. Now identify the element. Remember that the number of protons tells us what the element is. So if I look up number 23 on the periodic table, it is vanadium. All right. I don't know why I did that, but there we go. Perfect. Chemical bonds. So we have covalent bonds that we're going to start with here. Covalent bonds are bonds that form between atoms that are sharing their electrons. And so when we look at a molecule Oh, I guess I just gave it away. Uh, when we look at a chemical that has covalent bonds in it, the resulting collection of atoms is known as a molecule. So it's technically molecules are covalently bonded chemicals. Now here's what covalent bonding looks like. Um, you can picture that we have two hydrogen atoms that are far apart from each other, so they're not interacting. This graph shows you that if you go above a radius of 300, um, that we have hydrogen atoms that are basically you know, not even attracted to each other at all. Uh, they're just so far apart from each other. But as you bring them closer and closer together, eventually they're going to get close enough that we have the lowest amount of potential energy. And so when that happens, we form a covalent bond. And so the way the covalent bond forms are that the two electrons that are being shared um, are, are moving, are able to move, I guess I should say, uh, around our 
one uh, around one hydrogen versus the other hydrogen. So they're able to actually kind of be shared equally between the two. Uh, in this situation, sometimes they're not shared completely equally, but it's because of this intermolecular or sorry internuclear distance that we're looking at here uh, that we end up with a bond forming. And so notice that if you get even closer though, so like what if we were to push these things even closer together, eventually that amount of energy would start to rise and now you're pushing things too close. And so now you have, you know, kind of a crazy amount of increase in energy because it takes energy to push things closer and closer and closer together. Um, again, this is just kind of like a graphical way of looking at how a covalent bond forms. Now, ionic bonds. Ionic bonds form due to the force of attraction between oppositely charged ions. So ionic bonds are formed by cations and anions. Cations are positive, they have lost electrons. Anions are negative, they've gained electrons. An ion is literally just an atom or a group of atoms that has either a positive charge to it or a negative charge to it. So that Q is what we're looking at in our isotope notation in that situation here. So for ionic compounds, the way it works is a little bit different. Um, here I have my sodium, here I have a fluorine atom, and so you can see that the sodium is going to donate its um, electron, and so now I have a sodium ion and I have a fluoride ion. And so since I have an exchange of electrons, that means that I have an ionic bond that's forming between the two. And the reason why they're sticking together is because, just like we have learned in physics, positive and negative are attracted to each other. So just automatically they're kind of attracted. Notice the graph looks very, very similar. As they get closer, there's an attractive potential until they get close enough. And once they do that, we have the uh, minimum amount of potential energy. So we have a minimum here. That would be, again, at our um, as close as these two things can get to each other um, without repelling each other. And so that's why they form a ionic bond and how close they get to one another is important. If you push them closer and closer together, then we have a stronger internuclear repulsion. And so now we're going to end up creating, you know, actually something that's going to break apart instead. So let's write the isotope or atomic notation for the following. And then it says count the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So I have iron 58 with a plus 2 charge. So I need to look up iron on the periodic table. And I need to figure out what my number of electrons would be based on the charge, which is a plus 2. So something you need to be aware of, right, is that if something is positively charged, that means that it has less electrons in it than if it were neutral. And if it was negatively charged, it would have more electrons, because remember, electrons are negatively charged. So keeping all of this in mind, I would write the isotope notation like this. So the 58 goes here, that's the mass number. 26 is the atomic number of iron, and then I have my plus 2 charge here. So let's find our number of protons, which is the easiest. So protons are from here. That's number 26, so that's the number of protons. So to get the neutrons, think about this. If 58 is my mass number and 26 is my number of protons, then I must subtract the two to get the number of neutrons, which would be 32. Now, how do I get a plus 2 charge? Well, if 26 is what would get me to neutral, I would need to subtract 2 electrons and get 24 electrons in order to get a plus 2 charge overall. Next, sulfur 33 with a negative 2 or a 2 minus charge. All right, so look up sulfur on your periodic table. We've got sulfur is number 16. The mass number is 33, and I have a 2 minus charge. So let's start with our protons, which would be the easiest. Protons number right there we have is 16 directly from the periodic table. Neutrons, I have my mass number that's 33. Atomic number is 16. I subtract the 2 to get 17. And then here I have a negative charge. So that means that if 16 would get me to neutral, I would need extra electrons to get to a negative charge. So I would need to add 2 electrons, and I would get 18 electrons then as a result. Last but not least, manganese 68, no charge, so nice and easy. Notice I don't even put a zero here, that normally if it's not charged, we don't include a charge at all. So let's count, our protons are 25, that's manganese's atomic number. Our neutrons would be a subtraction of 43 now, so we have 43 neutrons. And then obviously if there's no charge, the number of protons and electrons have to be the same introduce the periodic table. Metals versus non-metals, families, and periods. So uh, groups or families, we use the word group though, uh, that would be a column on the periodic table. Okay, And so groups give us chemicals or elements that have similar chemical properties to one another. Periods are the horizontal rows on the periodic table. So 
these right here, as I go down, would be my families or my groups. And then these, as I go across here, these would be the periods. So if I'm counting, this would be period one, group one. This would be period one, group uh, 18, because we do, we count each one. So one, two, three, four. Notice it goes all the way to 18. So 18 is the uh, highest column we can get to on the periodic table. And then row-wise, we only have seven periods. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven is the uh, lowest period that we get to on the periodic table. Lanthanides and actinides, don't worry about those for now. All right. So uh, something you need to be aware of for groups and families. These are our common charges when we have ionic compounds. So the alkali metals are group one. So that would mean that these guys right here where we have H, L, I, N, A, K, R, B, C, S, and then F, R. Okay. Um, technically, okay, H, hydrogen here, is not an alkali metal, but it does form normally a plus one charge. Group two, we have the alkaline earth metals. And then we're going to skip everything until we get to the end here. Halogens are group 17, or 7A, but normally we say 17. And then noble gases, that would be group 18 here. They have a charge of zero. They don't really form any kind of ions. So what about the in-betweens? In-betweens, well, I guess I can tell you. These are the transition metals. They have a variety of charges, but they all form positive charges. Um, here we have group 13, they form a plus 3. Group 14 forms a plus or minus uh, 4. Group 15 forms a minus 3. Group 16 forms a minus 2, minus 1, and then obviously we have our 0 here. Okay, so just to keep in mind, that's how that works. This zigzag line is the separating device between metals on this side and nonmetals on that side. So there are way fewer and non-metals than there are metals on the periodic table. The elements that are touching the line, those are going to be your metalloids, with one exception, which is aluminum. All right, so how do we name compounds? So for binary compounds, they're composed of two elements. Binary literally means, or bi, I guess I should say, means two. So ionic and covalent compounds are included in binary compounds here. Uh, but what we're going to start with is the difference between ionic compounds versus our molecular or covalent ones. So binary ionic compounds are made up of a metal and a nonmetal. Covalent compounds or covalent molecules are made up of nonmetals only. So that zigzag line that you saw makes the big difference. If you have something from the left side that you are making a compound with on the right side, you have a binary ionic compound. On the other hand, if you're choosing two elements from the right side of that periodic table or hydrogen, which is also a nonmetal, then you're going to have a covalent compound instead. So let's talk about type 1. In type 1, the cation is always named first, and the anion is always named second. Monatomic cations take the name from the name of the element from the periodic table, whereas our anions, we have to change the ending to ide. So the way it would work is this. I have KCl, so K is potassium. Cl is chlorine, and so I change that to chloride, so that's potassium chloride. MgBr2, I just name Mg, that's magnesium. Br is bromine but I change the ending of Br to bromide, so it's magnesium bromide. CaO, Ca is calcium, O is oxygen. I change my ending for oxygen to ide though, so it becomes calcium oxide. Notice I didn't care about these subscripts. All I was naming was just the front part and then the second part, that was it. Now, Metals in type 2 can form more than one positive ion. So we have to actually point out what the charge on the metal is. So those are our transition metals. So transition metals, which there is a table of them um, on, I don't remember what page it is, but it's in your book in this section. Um, it gives you a list of common charges. Okay. So Roman numerals are what we use to indicate the charge of the metal on your cation. And like it says, transition metals usually require a Roman numeral. Now there are exceptions to that. The exceptions are um, going to be zinc, cadmium, and silver. They don't utilize Roman numerals when you're naming things. So for example, Again, make sure you look at your book, though. But here's our example here. We have CuBr. So Cu is copper. Br is bromide, right? But that means I don't know what kind of copper I'm talking about. Am I talking about copper 1 or copper 2 or copper 3? 
which copper doesn't form a 3, but still. Um, so how I figure this out is by looking at what the charge of my negative ion would be. So the charge on my negative ion here would be a minus 1, because bromide is a halogen, forms a minus 1. So I would have copper 1 bromide in order to balance that out. Next, FeS. So Fe is iron, S is sulfide, right? But again, I have to look at my charge here. So my charge on sulfide is a minus 2. That means my charge on my iron has to be a plus 2. So that would be iron 2 sulfide. Here, here's one that's always tricky for people. I've got lead, which is Pb. I've got O2, though. So O is actually a minus 2, which means if I have two of them, I have a minus 4 charge, which means my lead here would be a plus 4. So I would have lead 4 oxide. Again, you just make sure that you remember your Roman numerals 1 through 4, since those are the only ones that show up. What about polyatomic ions? So polyatomic ions, it even gives you the actual page number. I'm not sure if that's accurate, though, because again, remember, we are using different editions of the book, um, but it would be in this section. So uh, what about polyatomic ions? Well, remember, polyatomic ions are the ones that you had to memorize like, well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll point them out. OH is hydroxide. NO3 minus is nitrate, NH4 plus is ammonium, SO42 minus is sulfate. So uh, given what I just told you, we can name these pretty easily. NaOH would be sodium hydroxide, MgNO32 would be magnesium nitrate, and then NH4, SO4, NH4 is ammonium, SO42 minus is, is sulfate. So I have ammonium sulfate here. Now again, if you're wondering about the parentheses and all of that, your book goes into detail here, but it's any time you are putting a subscript next to another subscript, you would need to make sure that you have a parentheses around it in order to not make this look like it's MgNO32, which would look like MgNO32. So this uh, parenthesis becomes very important. Same thing here, if I didn't have parentheses, this would just be 42, and it would look like I have 42 H's, which is the opposite of what I would want to make you think. Formation of ionic compounds, great. So ionic compounds form um, very similar to the way covalent compounds form, except we're not looking at, in this case, a, um, a sharing of electrons. So here I've got my zinc, which has a 2 plus, and I have two chloride ions, which have minus ones, which is balancing out this charge. So now this has a neutral charge overall. Over here I have um, three NAs, and I have a PO4. Each oxygen here that has a single bond has a minus one charge to it. So each Na is actually attracted to the O uh, with the negative charge on this phosphate, which means that the overall charge on this would be neutral. But this is um, sodium phosphate. All right. Binary covalent compounds. So if you have two nonmetals, the first element is named first. And yes, you use the full element's name, just like we've been doing. The second element, though, is named as if it were an anion, even though it isn't. So we change the ending to "-ied". Now, we do use prefixes to denote the number of atoms that are present. And the prefix mono, which represents the number one, is never used for naming the first element on the list. So here are our prefixes. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca. So one through ten. So let's name some covalent compounds here. So I've got CO2, something that you already are aware of. I have carbon then, and then I have oxygen, which changes to oxide, but I have two of them. So that means I put the prefix di in front, so it becomes carbon dioxide. SF6, so S is sulfur. F is fluorine, but I change it to fluoride. I have six fluorides though, so that means it's hexafluoride. So I have sulfur hexafluoride. Uh, N2O4, again, I have nitrogen here. I have oxide here because oxygen is going to be my anion or would be named as if it's an ion in this case. So I have di for two and I have tetra for four. So that becomes dinitrogen tetroxide. Notice the spelling is a little weird here. Um, we're dropping the A when we put an A and an O next to each other. We do that. But again, all know what you mean. So here's our flowchart for naming binary compounds. Things you should ask yourself first, is it a binary compound? Yes, if so, then is there a metal? If there is not a metal, then we use those prefixes, mono, di, or tri. If the answer is yes, there is a metal, then we have to ask ourselves, do we have anything that can form more than one charge? If the answer to that is yes, then we use a Roman numeral. If the answer to that is no, then we name it normally like we did with type one. 
Now, here's our overall strategy, okay? So again, make sure that you look through this, but we have to ask ourselves about polyatomic ions again. Is there a polyatomic ion? Um, but again, it's pretty much exactly what we just did. Now let's talk about our last class here, which are going to be acids. So acids can be recognized by the hydrogen that appears first in the formula. So if you have something with an H at the beginning, that's going to let you know that you have an um, acid. Now molecules with one or more H plus attached, that's going to be, um, again, considered an anion. And so what we have here is if the anion does not contain oxygen, the acid is named with the prefix hydro, and then we add the suffix ic. So that's why it's hydrochloric acid. It's because what we do is if there's no oxygen present in the acid, we add the word hydro to the front, and then we add the suffix ic at the end. So for example, we have HCl. I kind of gave that one away already. But it's hydrochloric acid. So we care about the chlor part because that comes from chlorine. Next, we have HCN, okay? So again, CN is cyanide, so this would become a hydrocyanic acid. Next, we've got H2S. Again, I have hydro, and then S is going to be considered sulfuric acid, so hydrosulfuric acid is the way that would be written if it was in acid form. So if the anion does contain hydrogen, then we have two rules. We change the ending to ic if the anion that we're looking at ends in 8. On the other hand, um, there's a second rule because not every ion that we can name ends in 8. So for example here, let's go through some simple ones. HNO3. So NO3 is nitrate, so we drop the 8 and it becomes nitric acid. What about H2SO4? Again, SO4 is sulfate, so this becomes sulfuric acid. Next up, HC2H3O2, so this is acetate, so we drop the 8 and it becomes ic acid, so it becomes acetic acid, just like that, okay? So again, um, just remember that if you have an ion that ends in 8, it becomes ic, so it becomes ic acid as a result. Notice these do not have the word hydro in front of them. The only ones that do are if you don't have oxygen in it and you're only looking at two elements. Okay. If the anion does contain oxygen again, but it ends in ite, we actually drop the ending ite and it becomes us acid. So for example, just like this, we have HNO2. So again, NO2, that is nitrite. So this becomes nitrous acid. H2SO3, that is sulfite, right? So from sulfite, it becomes sulfurous acid. And then last but not least here, we have ClO2, that is chlorite, and so it becomes chlorous acid. And so here is our flow chart for naming acids. Does the anion contain oxygen? If it doesn't, it's hydro blank ic acid. On the other hand, if it does, then we have to look and see, does the anion end in ite or eight? If it ends in eight, it's ic acid. If it ends in ite, it's us acid, all right? And so that's the end of this one. So if you have any questions, please let me know.